Are you recording? Okay, perfect. So Romans chapter 8 and verse 28, here's what the Bible says. All right, you ready? Romans, if I can find the book of Romans here, good night, go in the wrong direction. Romans chapter 8 verse 28, notice what the Bible says. It says here, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now, the problem is, is people will see that and think that that's some kind of order. Well, first God foreknows you, then he predestinates you, then he calls you, then he justifies you, then he glorifies you. You know, the glorification is when we're with him in heaven and in our new bodies. They see that as an order of salvation. The problem is, is this is no type of order of salvation. This, everything that happens in verse 29 and 30 happens instantaneously at the moment of salvation. Let me explain. What does the Bible say? Remember in, 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 in Matthew 7 and in Matthew 25 and a bunch of different places, Jesus looks down and he says, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never what? Knew you. Okay? I never knew you. That means, you say, well that, well, that means God didn't know their address and didn't know anything. No, he didn't know them in a relationship aspect. Because we're talking about salvation. Is foreknowledge concerning salvation? Absolutely. So watch this. Those he did foreknow. Foreknowing simply means to know something or somebody beforehand. The Calvinists, the problem the Calvinists make is they see this word foreknowledge and automatically they try to make it say, well, that means he foreknew them all the way back before the foundation of the world. Hold on a second. When it comes to salvation, when does God know you? Does he know you before salvation or does he know you the moment of salvation? It's the moment of salvation. You say, how do you know that? Look at Galatians chapter, keep your finger in Romans 8, look at Galatians chapter 4. Look at Galatians chapter number 4. Galatians chapter number 4. Notice, when do you become known of God? Look at Galatians chapter 4 and look at there at verse number 7. Verse number 7. I'm sorry, verse number 8. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no God. So when ye knew not God, you didn't know God. Remember we, we have that phrase you know, back when I didn't know God and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah, but if you were predestinated for the foundation of the world and elect according to the foreknowledge of God, da, 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 then that means that you were, uh, that, that means that you didn't know God, but God sure didn't know you. Well, hold on a second. What does verse number nine say? But now after that ye have known God, Watch this now. Or rather are known of God. Do you see that there? When do you get known of God? When you get saved. God, when you're lost, God does not know who you are. Isn't that clearly what he says? Depart from me, I never knew you. Right? So watch this. When does foreknowledge take place? For those he did foreknow, then he'd also predestinate. Foreknowledge takes place at the moment of salvation. Or excuse me, predestination takes place at the moment of salvation. We'll look at that in just a second. But it's based upon foreknowledge. Listen, you're not elect until you get in Christ, right? I mean, the first mention of the word elect is Isaiah chapter 42, verse number 1. Who's the, word, who's the elect there? Jesus Christ. You can look at Isaiah 42, 1. Jesus Christ is the elect. You're not elect until you get in Christ. You don't get in Christ until the moment of salvation. Romans chapter 16, I believe it's verse number 9. The apostle Paul said that there were people in Christ before him. Well, how would that take place if everybody was in Christ before the foundation of the world? That doesn't make any sense. You get in Christ the moment of salvation. So now watch this. In order for you to be saved, God has to know you. In order for you to be elect, elect according to the foreknowledge of God. This word foreknowledge, 
simply means to know before. So watch this. I say, Lord, I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. I know I need you. And so right now I'm trusting in you to save me from hell and from my sin. And I put all my faith and trust in you. Boom. All of a sudden, God now knows who I am. Then, now that he knows me, he then, boom, predestinates me. Right. Does that make sense? You are not known of God. According to Galatians 4 9, you cannot get any plainer than Galatians 4 9. You are not known of God till the moment of salvation. So now that God knows me, he then predestinates me. What does predestination have to do with? See, here's the problem all Calvinists have. Well, we were predestinated before the foundation of the world. You cannot find that in the Bible with a magnifying glass and a spotlight. How are we predestinated? Or what are we even predestinated to? Look at Romans chapter 8. You still there in Romans chapter 8? Notice what it says. That we are predestinated to be conformed to what? The image of the Son. The image of the Son. The predestination deals with the image of his Son. Now, without going into a great big long Bible study, Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, right? But what happened? They sinned and lost that image. So then in uh, Genesis 5, Adam bears Seth. He bears a son in his what? Own likeness. Now, the Bible very clearly says in 1 Corinthians 15 that when we are resurrected or when the rapture happens, whether we're alive and our bodies are changed or we're resurrected and they're turned into a new body, the Bible says that when we receive our new glorified bodies, according to 1 Corinthians 15, that is when we will receive the image of the heavenly. Right now, I am not in the image of the heavenly. I know when you look at me, it's hard to think that this body didn't come straight from heaven. <laughs> All right? But right now, I'm not in the image of the heavenly. I am still bearing the sinful marred image. But at the rapture, so notice, look, look at Ephesians chapter 1. Here's where that word predestination is also used. Look at Ephesians chapter number 1. Ephesians chapter number 1. And look there at verse number um, 4. According as he hath chosen us in him, you didn't get in him until you got saved, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto salvation. Is that what it says? No. It says unto the what? Adoption of children. So you're predestinated to be conformed to the image of the Son. You're also predestinated to what? To the adoption. Now, hold on a second. Hold on a second. What is the adoption? You know, the, the prim I love the song by the primitives. Now I'm no longer an orphan. Someone has rescued me. You know, all that kind of thing. And it's, it's talking about being adopted. But here's the problem with that. It's not exactly doctrinally accurate. Because we are not adopted yet. According to Romans chapter 8, we've received the spirit of adoption. But notice Romans chapter 8, verse 23. Look at Romans 8, 23. Romans chapter 8, look there at verse 23. All right, now look, look what it says here. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. The adoption takes place when we receive our glorified bodies, the redemption of the body. Our bodies are not yet redeemed. So notice, being conformed to the image of his son, that takes place when you get a new body. The adoption, that takes place when you get a new body. All Both references to predestination refer to when you get a new body, not the salvation of your soul. It's the salvation of the body, not the soul. Does that make sense to everybody? So notice, now here's the thing. What is foreknowledge? By the way, foreknowledge and predestination 
Calvinists always love to get those two phrases mixed. They interchange them. They act like they're the same thing. You can even throw election in there. They act like election, foreknowledge, and predestination are all the same thing, and they're not. You know why? You know how I know they're different? Because they're spelled different, amen? They're not the same thing. So now notice. Foreknowledge, when God knows you, when you get saved and you become known of God, he then predestinates you at the moment of salvation to one day receive a glorified body. And it's right there in plain English. You can't get any plainer. I've showed you what, how many verses? Seven or eight verses there that clearly show that that all is talking about. That's all it's talking about. Calvin has tried to muddy up the water. Now notice, let me ask you this. Are you right now? Are you called? Are you called in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Make your calling and election sure, right? Paul said, "For you are called in Jesus Christ." So notice the list here. All right. At the moment of salvation, did you get known of God? Absolutely. So based upon that foreknowledge, now that God knows you, see, you don't get predestinated and then know. There has to be foreknowledge. God has to know you before He can predestinate you. Okay? So, you're predestinated. At the moment of salvation, you got called. At the moment of salvation, you got justified. And at the moment of salvation, you got glorified. Your soul got glorified. Where are you seated right now? Well, I'm seated at Bible Baptist Church. No. Your body is, but your soul is seated in heavenly places in Christ. You're already seated in heaven. Like one preacher used to say, uh, when I get to heaven, I'll have to sit there, or I'll have to scoot over just to sit down beside myself, amen? Because you're already there. Does that make sense? How about, how about the, the part of John, I don't know, about drawing? Yeah. That's, yep, absolutely. John 6, 44. No man can come unto me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. There's a few things about that verse. Number one, if we want to take that doctrinally, you've got to be careful because Jesus is talking to a bunch of Jews there. Now, I'm not getting raised up at the last day. You know what I'm getting raised up? At the rapture. The last day is not until, you know, depending on what, how you want to debate the last day, if it's the second half then or after the millennial kingdom. But uh, either way, I'm not getting raised up at the last day. Number two, even if we were to take some of that doctrine, which I do, Calvin, the problem with Calvinists is they say, well, you know, uh, unless God draws you, you can't get saved. Well, I believe that. But here's the problem. They act like God only draws. Well, God only draws the elect. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, here's the problem. You know the biggest problem with Calvinists? They never keep reading. A Calvinist gets in Romans 9, and they never seem to get to Romans 11. They say, well, see, Romans 9 says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. Yeah, but Romans 11 says he has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. That's right. God will have mercy upon whom he will have mercy. But the fact is, is he says that he wants to have mercy on everybody. They don't, they don't keep reading. So the problem with the Calvinists in John 6 is they never keep reading to John 12. You know what John 12, 32 says? Jesus said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The only, only twice that word draw is used in reference to God drawing. In fact, the command is for you to draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Well, how can we do that if we're totally incapable of drawing nigh to God because we're you're so depraved and all that kind of stuff? So, yes, does a man have to be drawn by the Father to get saved? Absolutely. But at Calvary, Jesus drew all men. So now the responsibility is laid in the lap of the individual. God's already drawn all men. It's their decision now whether or not they want to get saved. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. You can end that recording.